Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also say, too, to those of you who've been hitting me up uh, by email based on my Esquire 777 YouTube account, uh, who want to talk about Stephen Avery and the second season on Netflix of that case, just understand I will get to that case. I first need to watch all the episodes online and then do a little bit of research. So I'll get to that video. No need to blow up my email any further. Now let's talk about this video, this boxing video for Dwyer70905 on YouTube, right? Let me add to the warning I gave earlier. I want people to understand that I feel the way to make money betting, it's a philosophy, is to take live underdogs, guys who the public might not know or might have written off. Right? That's how you make money. That's when you're getting better than even money odds. That's when you can hedge. An ideal hedging situation is when you are getting better than even money odds on both sides of the hedge. Right? Understand, getting better than even money odds on one side of the bet might even allow you to hedge at less than even money on the other side of the bet. Right? You have to apportion your bet in a way where it pays if A or B happens, right? So I know here online, at times it looks like I'm taking more underdogs than other sites. Well, great. As I say, long-term, more bear for us, right? I will take favorites when I feel that it's warranted. But I do feel that the betting market for boxing is off. Right, that fans overreact to what happened in the last fight or the last game. Now, with that in mind, you've been warned. Right, we take risks here. Let's go forward with this video. First, just a few comments on the great performance by Demetrius Andre over Walto Katam Dokwa. Right, Kotam Dokwa. Let me give his last name justice. Right. I thought it was a great performance. I thought Boo Boo, who is a right-handed guy fighting out of a left-handed stance, who still has great lateral movement, won this fight on his lateral movement and his timing. Understand, when you see a guy who's inverted like this, he's aware of and he's playing the angles. So Katan Dokwa had an excellent jab. Right? You didn't see it in this fight. I encourage you to look at some of his prior fights. You didn't see it in this fight because Demetrius Andre is going southpaw and is moving. Right? So, do, um, so Kotan Dokwa really didn't get the opportunity to show what makes him an elite fighter. So, hats off to Demetrius Andre. For those keeping track, Andre is also on the zone. Right? Eddie Hearn has said that one of Canelo's fights is going to be against Andre. When it happens, I think Canelo is in trouble because of Andre's footwork. Right? Let me also say, too, Andre is 6 1. Right? How these fighters make weight. This fight was at 160, is one of life's mysteries. Right? Let me just say, I don't expect Andre. Who's calling out a lot of people? But I don't expect Andre to stay at 160 pounds. Keep in mind, this is a guy who's unbeaten, who's the former 154-pound champion, right? There's just too much. There's just too much going on at 168 pounds, right? You have some older lions, James DeGale, George Groves, who are still putting themselves out there. DeGale is about to fight Chris Eubank in a very dangerous fight, right? You have new stars, Callum Smith, 
Gilberto Ramirez, right, with titles in the division. You even have Golovkin talking about going up to 168. And, of course, Canelo, the biggest box office star in the division, is there, but he's untested at the weight, and he's fighting one of the champs, Rocky Fielding. So, I believe Andre is going to follow the Mikey Garcia blueprint. Garcia is a guy who picks up a title, looks around, and then says, hey, what's the next challenge? Right? Garcia will do a pit stop in a weight class, pick up a title, and then move to the next weight class. I believe that Andre, who's now in his 30s, right? He's now in his 30s. Understand that life is too short, especially when a lot of his game relies on things like lateral movement and his legs, things that go first. You know what they say in boxing? The legs go first, right? Power is the last to go. So if I'm Andre, who doesn't fight that much as it is, this is one of those sporadic fighters. You see him, and then you're thinking to yourself, oh, wow, this guy's still fighting? I believe Andre, because of the money at 168, because of the fact that he's on the zone, and the zone has a contract with Canelo, right? Callum Smith right now is calling out Canelo. You get the feeling a lot of the big names at 168 are going to end up on the zone, right? I'm guessing Andre doesn't stick around. 160, right? Part of why he might not stick around 160 has to do with the fight we're going to talk about here in this video, Darianchenko versus Danny Jacobs. But let's backtrack a little bit. Understand, we're all amateur promoters. A star was born in the Andre fight, right? Now, I know the zone is new. The guys tried to tell you that Koton Dokwa was 5'11". Folks, <laughs> this is one of those rare times where a 5'11 guy was taller than the 6'1 guy. Understand, Koton Dokwa is one of the tallest guys I've ever seen at middleweight. In fact, the team, Brian Kenny, Sugar Ray Leonard, Sergio Mora, they all understood when he entered the ring that this guy wasn't 5'11". Let me also point out, too, that height should be viewed with suspicion in boxing, right? They try to tell you that guys like Canelo are 5'10", you know better, right? That's why we look at weigh ins Understand, Koton Dokwa was taller than 6'1", Demetrius Andre, right? This guy is huge. Now, when you go see a movie, you need a good bad guy, right? You have the good guy. Let's say it's, you know, uh, Austin Powers. You need Dr. Evil, right? Let's say the good guy is James Bond. You need Dr. No, don't you? Right? The great crime shows need good criminals, right? You need a guy wearing a black hat who's convincing. Now, let me just say, I know most in boxing don't know Katon Dokwa, right? His physical presence, just the size of the guy, with his KO percentage, going into this fight, it was above 90%. In other words, the size and the risk of danger should put him on every network's and every promoter's short list as an opponent for one of these superstars out there. Right? This guy is a revelation. Let me also say something else, too. Right? The guy came to fight. Now, what I want people to do, what I want sanctioning bodies who stumble on this video to consider is the fact that this guy was done wrong. I'm not saying he would have won the fight. What I'm saying, though, is the fight easily could have stopped. 
Now understand, he's a righty. He's fighting a southpaw, or at least a guy in a southpaw stance, right? Their feet tangle. This is clear on film. Their feet tangle. This is in the first round, right? So he starts to go down. Andre throws a punch. Folks, look at the film. I hope the sanctioning body does. The punch misses. So when Cotton Dokwa hits the canvas in the first round, the two guys in the arena who know that he's on the canvas because the feet got tangled are himself and Andre. Andre knows he hasn't hit Cotton Dopo with anything that would drop him. He knows that. So then he commits a cardinal sin in boxing. Folks, it's one of the worst things you can do. This is how Roy Jones Jr., a superstar, got his first loss. With Katan Dokwa clearly on the canvas, clearly on the canvas, Andre rears back and hits him. Right? Go back and revisit that Roy Jones Montel Griffin first fight. That's what happened. Now, it's only because Kanton Dokwa is a serious competitor and not a charlatan that after he's hit, after the referee counts it as a knockdown, what's Steve Willis thinking? Right? Ref made a mistake. It happens. Sometimes refs are behind a fighter. They don't really see what happened. In real time, it wasn't clear. Right? At home, obviously, I had the benefit of slow motion. But they counted that as a knockdown. Now, I'm telling you, there are many fighters in the sport. Right? Some of them have fought Jean Pascal. There are many fighters in the sport who, when they get fouled blatantly like that, and Brian Kenny on the telecast caught it, many guys will stay down. Right? The idea is, look, I'm, I've gotten good money, good money for this championship fight. Let me get good money for the rematch. Let me tie up this champ so he can't fight anyone until we clear this up. Until we have a legitimate fight. Some fighters would have just rolled around on the canvas, right? Then lodged a dispute and said, look, Look at the videotape. I'm not hit. I go down because our feet get tangled. And then this guy clearly hits me on the canvas. Understand, Andre would have to admit what we all saw. Yeah, I hit him while he was on the canvas. Ray Leonard was trying to say on the telecast at first, oh, he's a warrior. He's caught up in the moment. Boxing's a passionate sport, right? No, Katan Doak was on the canvas. <laughs> He's on the canvas too long, in my opinion, for that argument to have any gravitas. At a minimum, Andre would have to admit, yeah, I did hit him when he was on the canvas. So understand, Katan Dokwa gets jobbed in the first round because the ref calls it a knockdown. Right? Calls it a knockdown. So what does Katan Dokwa do? He gets off the canvas. He continues to fight, right? This is a serious man. He was there to pick up a title, folks. He wasn't there to win by disqualification or try to get a second payday and drag this out. No, he got fouled. He knew it. He got hit on the canvas. He knew it, right? The ref made a mistake. He knew it. He doesn't even complain to the referee. Why bother? He has a job to do. He has a title to win. We'll deal with this ref another time, right? Now, Steve Willis is a great ref, right? He's a personal favorite of mine. He had a bad night, right? He had a bad night. It happens to the best of them, right? But let's just say I want people to revisit that first round. If I'm the sanctioning body, you don't have to order a rematch. But in my opinion, Katan Dokwa should get some kind of special treatment. In other words, he should maintain his place in the standings, the rankings, 
Maybe you want to allow him to fight in an eliminator. Something needs to be done because the rules were not followed. Okay, let's shift gears. Let me get myself in trouble here by recommending some risky plays. Now look, people here know I think the world, the world of Danny Jacobs, right? Understand before we get to Danny Jacobs, the boxer, you need to deal with Danny Jacobs, the man. Right? This is a guy who was a cancer survivor. Folks, I didn't think he'd make it back. Right? They had to take out part of his body. Right? It's shocking that Danny Jacobs has made it back to boxing. It's even more shocking that Danny Jacobs has made it back at a championship level. Right? This is also a guy who fights tough guys. Unbeaten, Dmitry Pirog. Jacobs fought him. Kid Chocolate, Jacobs fought him. Golovkin, Jacobs fought him. Sergio Mora, who had the belt. Let's remember, Sergio Mora beat Vernon Forrest. Right? In a lower weight class. Danny Jacobs fought him. Right, Jacobs is a guy who believes he's the best and he wants to fight the best. Right, I tip my hat to him. He's really a champion's champ. Right, he's the role model who happens to be a great fighter. Right, and he truly is a boxer puncher. Right, you see some guys who are loading up on shots. Danny Jacobs can decide to simply outbox you. He's fighting Golovkin, the roof caves in. He hits the canvas. Right? What does Danny Jacobs do? He gets off the canvas. He goes southpaw, for crying out loud. He then outboxes Golovkin for a few rounds. Makes that fight competitive. Goes the distance with him. Right? So understand, I have great respect for Danny Jacobs. But what I want people to do, what I want gamblers to do, is to look closely at this line. And then to look closely at his opponent. Right? Darienchenko is a plus 175. He's a plus 175. Five. Understand too, Darienchenko's friends with Danny Jacobs. Darienchenko, <laughs> Darienchenko, decorated amateur, big time amateur career. Would it surprise you to know that he has already sparred for more than 300 rounds with Danny Jacobs? Understand, as good as Danny Jacobs is, Darienchenko knows his game because he's seen it up close for a protracted period of time. Now, who's the kind of guy who would give Danny Jacobs problems? I think it's this kind of guy. Understand, Darienchenko was a star in the World Series of Boxing. When you look at him, what I want you to do is to look at his neck. He has a short neck like mine. Right? There's a Mike Tyson quality to this fighter. Right? Darienchenko knows how to move his head. Right? He's hard to find in the ring. Not only that, like Tyson, Darienchenko will hit you, hurt you, then he'll pivot. This is a guy who, in the middle of hurting you, will move around the pocket. Not to hide, to change the angle on you. In other words, he hits you, you're dazed for a second. 
right? Days for a second. Then the guy is over here. So as you turn, right, as you turn to get back at him, he has a surprise for you. Right? The guy has fast hands, lateral movement. He's two-handed, just like Mike Tyson. And he will aggressively follow you around the ring. Aggressively. Now, I don't think the public knows this guy. He's actually older than Danny Jacobs. Right? I view this fight as really a 50-50 fight. But the odds matter. If I'm going to get a plus 175 on Darianchenko, I'm going to take it. The bet I'm recommending here is Darianchenko. Shorter guy than Danny Jacobs. He's going to be aggressively trying to find Danny Jacobs. Right? I think the visual is going to be bad for Jacobs. I think Jacobs is going to have to load up on punches and try to take this guy out. Understand, Jacobs has that kind of power. Just ask Kid Chocolate. Right? Jacobs has that kind of power. The bet I'm recommending is Darianchenko to win the fight. That's right. Hedged with Jacobs by stoppage. That's how I see that one. Now let's move to another fight. And this fight has one of boxing's more interesting figures. And again, he's not as known as he should be. Now first, let me just talk history for a moment. You know when champion Sonny Liston fought Muhammad Ali, both of the guys, both of them, had great jabs, right? I would argue that Liston's jab is probably his best punch, right? Both of the guys had great jabs, great jabs. The difference between the two guys was that only one of them had legs, and that was Ali. Right, so that fight is a story of Ali using his legs to move away from Liston's jab, then jumping in with his own jab and his combinations. That's after, of course, spending a masterpiece first round, just moving around the ring, away from Liston's jab, without even throwing a punch. Right, folks, I encourage you to look at the first round of Ali Liston, understand that is Ali's first shot at the title. And his interpretation of the sport was to enter the ring, hardly throw a punch. And in my opinion, he wins that first round against Sonny Liston. Liston's following him around the ring and can't land. Now, let me just say this. That's the problem with great footwork. Fighters fall in love with it, right? They have a toy that they just can't put down. So, Fury had a shot at the heavyweight title. He was fighting Joseph Parker in his backyard. He fell in love with his footwork in the fight. Like Ali, in the first round, against Sonny Liston. Fury didn't throw enough punches, right? He's outmaneuvering Joseph Parker, right? The problem is when you're that deeply into chess, right? When you're doing a strategy thing, Pernell Whitaker against Oscar De La Hoya, when you're doing a strategy thing and you're being brilliant and the other guy can't find you, right in the squared circle the other guy the other guy doesn't know how to corner you and you're moving around the ring you think that's enough now it would be enough obviously if the judges were Ali Pernell Whitaker and Yui Fury 
right? But those are never the judges, right? Quite frankly, you're lucky if you don't have three blind mice judging a fight. They want to see punches landed. The guy who barely knows boxing but who has the money to buy the ringside seat, he wants to see blood and guts. Not some ballet type performance where you're pivoting and you're in the pocket, you're dropping a shoulder, you're pulling it back, the other guy's swinging and missing, you're then moving around, the other guy's trying to find your head, you're moving your head, the guy can't catch you. Boxers know that's brilliant stuff. Sometimes the judges don't know it. Many times the crowd doesn't know it. So what Yuri Fury, what Yui Fury is going to have to do in Kubrat Pulev's backyard is he's going to have to remember to throw his hands. He's going to have to pick spots and come in and flurry. He's going to have to remind us that, hey, I'm making this guy miss. This guy can't make me miss. <laughs> I have the upper hand. I can hit this guy when I want to. Right? So, if I'm Fury, I have to work a jab in. It has to be the kind of thing where as he's dipping his shoulder and moving and crossing his feet and making it happen and, you know, floating around the ring, right? Float like a butterfly. Right? In this flat-footed heavyweight era, Fury has the best legs in the heavyweight division. Right? As Fury's floating like a butterfly, in my opinion, he needs to bust off some combinations. I think they're there for him. Understand, he's not fighting a guy with a big punch. He's fighting a guy who is kind of like Dylan White. Dylan White hits harder than uh, Kubrat Pulev. But he's fighting a guy who's kind of like Dylan White who wants to exchange with you in the pocket. Right? He's fighting a guy who needs for you to slow down for him. Just like Liston needed Ali to slow down for him. What Fury, who showed great stamina against Joseph Parker, needs to do. By the way, that was one of Parker's best fights, too. That's Joseph Parker upset, showing aggression. Right? What Fury needs to do. Right? Parker officially won the fight. What Fury needs to do here is to channel Ali. Not the Ali in the first round against Liston. Right, but he needs to channel the Ali later in that fight, who is keeping Liston at bay, is throwing combinations at him, is making him miss, and is making it so that we see the stylistic difference between the fighters. Fury's going to look better than Pulev does, but we also see the punches landed on the compu box, right? He's fighting in Pulev's backyard. He's practically showing up. I don't care who the judges are. He's practically showing up down two rounds. If I'm Fury, I start fast. I try to land my jab, then back away from Pulev's, make people understand that I'm making Pulev miss then I have to have moments, moments he doesn't have against Joseph Parker. I have to have moments where I plant my feet and I throw combinations before getting out of dodge. I believe if Kubrat Pulev does that, this plus 120 underdog wins this fight in Pulev's backyard. The bet I like here is Fury to win the fight, the underdog, right, to win the fight, hedged with Pulev by decision, right? I don't think Pulev is going to be able to find Fury. I know Pulev 
stopped Alexander Ustinov and stuff like that. That's because Ustinov stayed in the pocket too long. I don't believe Fury is going to make that mistake. Let me also add, too, that when you're the odd man, when you're the guy bucking the trend, when you're in a home run hitter, flat-footed, stay-in-the-pocket heavyweight era, and you're the guy who's moving around the ring like Ali was in the mid-60s, you have a distinct advantage. What Fury needs to do as he moves around the ring is to sit down on some punches, land some shots before he gets back on his bike. He also needs to listen to the crowd. If the crowd starts getting restless, if they don't understand the value of movement, right? If the crowd is hostile to him, he needs to change his strategy and be more active, be more in the pocket. Make sure that if it goes to the judges, he doesn't get ripped off. I like Fury to win this fight, plus 120. I'll hedge the play with Pulev by decision. That's how I see that fight. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.